Well, thank you very much, Rob, and thanks to the Alliance for an invitation to speak again uh, at the uh, meeting on the Mesa. And while we're getting hooked up, uh, let me also congratulate all of you diehards for hanging in there to the bitter end. I'm excited to tell you about the progress we've made over the past year, and so, Rob, do I just advance with yeah. this? Okay. So by way of background, uh, HealthPoint is focused on bioactive solutions for wound care, and we see that as a, a leverage point and as a foundation to bridge into a regenerative medicine future. So we've got a handful of biologic technologies and the associated expertise that goes along with those technologies combined with about two decades of experience in commercial wound care to produce a company that you see a synopsis of here about 194 million in revenues in 2012 with a very attractive year-over-year -year growth rate of 30 percent, highly profitable with gross margins in the mid-70s, and an outlook for a commercial portfolio that we think is very positive for uh, years of continued strong growth with the three brands that drive that portfolio. And that allows us to organically fund development of a novel cell therapy product for wound care that is also um, has vestiges of a platform that could lead us to other dermal repair and regeneration, regenerative technologies in the future. Uh, we've got an experienced team, we're all great people, and so uh, we believe we're ideally positioned to benefit from the key trends that are propelling our market forward, which are very similar to all of your markets. The market is rather large. This is a look at the U.S. difficult to heal wound market comprised of several different uh, diseases and, um, and, and origins about 4.6 million total and propelled by, uh, again, all the same demographic and disease trends that we're familiar with and been discussed extensively at this meeting. Another characteristic of this market that resonates against a theme that is very prominent here these last couple days is this uh, degree of unmet need, which still remains quite high in wound care. A key reason for that is the market has been dominated by what are now commodity devices for uh, some period of time. There was a speaker yesterday that talked about going to a, a wound care conference. You'll see everybody selling basically the same three technologies just in different packaging, and to a large extent, that's true. Uh, these are 510K devices that have been around for a long time, and they basically have one of two functions. One is to manage the physical forces that are affecting the tissue. The other is to manage the, the moisture content of that tissue. But that is uh, now decades-old standard of care, and it leads to uh, outcomes that are rather marginal. In terms of venous leg ulcers, about 50% of wounds heal, and for diabetic foot ulcers, the situation is worse. A quarter to a third of those wounds heal, and uh, the deleterious effects of an unhealed diabetic foot ulcer are significant. It's the number one cause of non-traumatic lower limb amputation in the United States, and the morbidity associated with a lower limb amputation is extremely high and on par with a number of cancers such as colon cancer. So that just speaks to uh, how deleterious uh, that sequelae can be. And so the market is large, rapidly growing, high level of unmet need, and into this environment we bring a biopharmaceutical approach that's been rather successful. You can see a, an accelerating growth curve on a larger revenue base here over the last several years. The key drivers really have to do with uh, the, these major uh, characteristics of our business, a differentiated value proposition that we invest heavily in, in terms of comparative and cost effectiveness data to further validate that differentiation. Uh, we've also been added, adding growth driving brands to the portfolio. One brand in 2010, 2011, two brands this year, and next year we'll launch uh, a biologic that we recently acquired, so that will give us three brand drivers. And uh, uh, commensurate with that, we've been expanding our sales organization, as you can see, already rather large in the United States, but driven by the adding addition of the third brand and a, a high degree of analytics that convince us that we're still just scratching the surface of this market. We're planning our largest sales expansion to date for 2013. We also uh, put a lot of effort into uh, the reimbursement channels, and, and here we have um, products that, that flow through the, both the pharmaceutical benefit and the medical benefit, and so we're building up and demonstrating our expertise down both of those channels, and then two of these products are BLAs and so have uh, significant degrees of protection. And so the, the focus of the management team, in part, has been to secure the commercial business and make sure we get that on a strong growth trajectory so that we're dropping a lot of uh, free cash flow to fund uh, development of novel agents uh, that, that, that really are the next generation of therapies in wound care and beyond in other dermal repair and regeneration technologies. And that pipeline is headlined by HP802, which is an allogeneic uh, living cell bioformulation that's comprised of two components. 
the first of which are two cell types that are growth arrested in, um, uh, in thrombin solution and a cryoprotectant. The second component is a fibrinogen solution. And when those two components are sprayed onto the wound surface, that's the delivery mechanism, is a spray delivery, the thrombin and fibrinogen form a human fibrin uh, provisional matrix, which is very much akin to the situation that develops as soon as the body is initially wounded. If you have a cut, your body forms a fibrin clot. And so the cells in that environment are highly active and know that that's a situation that they, they need to repair. And so the delivery of our cells in that environment, we think, is one of the keys to the um, efficacy that you'll see in just a minute. In addition, we think also defining the dose is extremely important. And that seems like a, a, a no-brainer, but in a, in a market dominated by devices, this is somewhat of a novel concept. And for us, with this product, dose is really combined uh, uh, is uh, defined by three different characteristics. One is the ratio of keratinocytes to fibroblasts. And in our product, we've optimized that at one to nine. It's also the, the number of cells applied per application and the frequency of applications. And so with that approach, we have uh, generated these efficacy data. And I'll walk you through. There are really two studies here, both on the same population. Through the first 12 weeks, and I think you can see that slightly shaded in gray, uh, is the randomized controlled uh, portion of the phase 2b trial. This is in venous leg ulcers. And in this trial, we compared four dose groups to a control. This was a total of 228 patients. And I'm showing you here the best observed dose, which, as it turned out, was the lowest of the four doses we tested. Uh, the dose range, uh, or the highest dose was 20-fold the number of cells that you see um, in, this, uh, in this low dose delivered every two weeks. But you can see a very robust efficacy versus the control group, a 24% difference, which was highly statistically significant at 12 weeks. And patients in this trial had the option to roll over into six months observational follow-up where treatment uh, of the test article was halted and the clinicians could just treat them on whatever it is they wanted to put on those patients. If they, if they had a wound that was healed, they would be on uh, probably two-layer compression. If their wound was not healed, whether they had been in the treatment group or the control arm, they went on to whatever it was the clinician thought was best to treat that patient at that time. And you can see, despite the fact that they all um, regressed to the mean in terms of uh, treatment approaches, that that difference in the cell therapy effect was maintained uh, out to six months. And so we were very excited about these efficacy results. Uh, we were more excited when The Lancet decided to publish our Phase 2B paper about two months ago. And I, I don't need to tell this group about all of the, the characteristics and the statistics associated with The Lancet, but we were excited further by the fact that they had an invited commentary that accompanied our publication. And that spoke to some of the, uh, what, what the uh, commentary authors were, were sounding hopeful about changing standard of care and introducing products like this earlier in the treatment paradigm to help affect the total cost of care, and that again was a, a common theme at this at this conference. Uh, and then just to take our excitement one level higher, the Lancet put out their own press release on our article, and the title of that press release, we couldn't have written it any better, Spray on Skin Could Revolutionize Treatment of Venous Leg Ulcer. So very pleased with the, uh, the Lancet's point of view on, on the Phase 2B results. And our next steps are now we're in Phase 3. We started the U.S. trial about six weeks ago. We plan to, uh, to start the EU trial uh, mid-2013. And then um, we're adding, a, 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 a beyond those two pivotal trials, some additional clinical work to augment the label, and also in response to the FDA's request to better understand mechanism, which we certainly see as a very, very tall order. Not sure we can ever really nail down an answer, but we are configuring a combination of preclinical and clinical studies to, uh, to attack that problem and, and, um, uh, and, 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 deem, and see what we can figure out. And then finally, just to flesh out the picture, for us, we made a decision this year in terms of long-term commercial manufacture and manufacturing platform and capabilities. We decided that we needed to own that, um, uh, that investment, needed to own that capability for our own uh, strategic, uh, long-term strategic flexibility. So we, we initiated a two-phase program. Uh, the first you can see detailed here at a high level in terms of um, uh, getting clinical supplies in for the phase three. Also, process development for future scale-up for commercial manufacture. That will be completed by the end of this year, and those supplies will, will flow into the Phase 3 program.
Then in terms of the commercial footprint, we are going to uh, utilize some of the tools that were talked about yesterday and today to manage our cost of goods in terms of automation and robotics and traceability. And so <clears throat> in essence, our overall strategy here was to get 802 to market efficiently with as low a cost of goods so that we can be cost competitive uh, in this environment and in this market, also ensure that we have the capacity to meet what we think the commercial demand would be, and then to give ourselves the platform to move into other cell and cell matrix technologies uh, in, you know, in future development um, initiatives. And so to wrap up, our focus is to continue driving our strong commercial growth, adding that third brand in 2013, advance our cell therapy through to approval in the next several years, and in the process, uh, evaluate what additional technologies that we want to bring into the portfolio, whether they be post-market approved products or post-approval products or pre-approval products that complement our uh, regenerative medicine future, and then uh, from an overall standpoint, to continue to establish the role of biologics and regenerative medicine in wound care, and then in uh, more broadly dermal repair and regeneration. Thank you very much.